Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require assistance at any time during the conference, please press star, then zero, on your touchstone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Mr. Hal Wagner. Mr. Wagner, you may begin. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to our conference. Uh, before we uh, begin, I'd like to introduce today's panelists and give you some details. We're going to run for one hour. If you have questions, please utilize the Q&A function on the live meeting by clicking Q&A on the toolbar and typing in your question. Jackie Wright will take as many questions as time permits. If we don't have time for your question, we will follow up with you privately. The panel recording and presentation materials will be posted on Foley.com, so you'll be able to hear this later if you want. You'll receive an email notification when the materials are available. We've applied for one hour of CLE credit for this presentation. If you've got questions, please email Meg Ryan at our firm to assist you. For audio assistance, press pound zero. Now I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker. Kevin Noonan is a super lawyer who has one of the very best blogs. Uh, many times blogs have a lot of nonsense or opinions of just what I think about this or that. Patent docs that he does with Don Zoom is one of the very best in terms of Hamlet analysis and probably the very best in biotech. Goes into great detail on the most important cases. Kevin's a PhD from John Marshall. I'm sorry, from Princeton University, uh, graduate from John Marshall. He's been an adjunct professor at several law schools where he teaches patents and, and prosecution and biotech patent law especially. It's also a great pleasure to introduce Professor Sarnoff, who's now on the tenure track at DePaul Law School. Congratulations, Josh. Josh is one of the leading thinkers in, in this area. And unlike most professors, he's a registered patent attorney and a former member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Circuit Bar Association, a very prolific writer. He's taken a very pointed position in Myriad Genetics case in both uh, levels, and uh, it's great to have a chance to hear his views differ from other people's views. Hans Sauer, I've known since he was in private practice, he's the Deputy General Counsel for IP for the Bio, Biotechnology Industry Organization, the world's largest organization in that field. He, he really gives advice to the board and everybody else on, on, on uh, all the very important issues. Before he was at Bio, he was Chief Patent Counsel for MGI Pharma, and he was Senior Patent Counsel at Guilford Pharma. He's done uh, several research and drug development programs, responsible for patent procurement and polio, uh, portfolio oversight, and he's got a master's degree in biology from Ulm in, in his native Deutschland, a Ph.D. in neuroscience from Lund, Sweden, and a J.D. from the Georgetown University Law Center, where he's an adjunct professor. Finally, my good friend and colleague Jackie Wright is is with us, who's going to run the program today. She's a partner in the in the uh, Chem Bio practice at Foley, does a lot of counseling in all aspects of IP. She's got a PhD in pharmacology from UVA, and she clerked for Chief Judge Rader at the Federal Circuit for two years. She's done an awful lot of writing and speaking on IP topics and biologics and personalized medicine. Took a lead role in one of the major Amakai briefs in the Myriad case. So thanks to all the panelists. Now I'm turning this over to Jackie, who knows everything. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hal. Um, hold on, let me uh, still work on the slides. All right, um, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, presentation that's just some of the background for the case to make sure that everybody who's actually listening is, is on the same page. Um, I recognize some of this may be uh, rudimentary for those of you who have been following the case pretty closely, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, the case um, that we're talking about here is, uh, it has been called the ACLU versus Myriad case. Those are the, the parties that are, that are duking it out. And um, we're, we're dealing with the issue of gene patenting. That's the, the buzzword that everybody talks about. And we're talking about the issue of whether such um, subject matter is patent eligible. And I just want to clarify what, what we mean by that. What I've, uh, what I've reproduced here is 35 U.S.C. Section 101. This is, the statute itself is, is reproduced so you can see it for yourself. 
Um, that statute 101 deals with two components. It deals with utility and also um, subject matter eligibility. We're going to be talking about subject matter eligibility only, um, not to be confused with, with utility. Also not to be confused with other components of what um, constitutes something that is, is patentable. Um, this is important to keep in mind issues of novelty, non-obviousness, um, enablement, written description, um, those types of things. That's not what we're talking about here, and it's important to keep that in mind because part of the controversy in this case is um, the fact that we're dealing what, what some people have done, dubbed just the, the threshold, meeting Section 101, whether you can basically get out of the starting block, block to even consider whether you can go um, address other issues such as novelty and the like. Now, in, in the statute itself, it says that any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, or any, or any improvement thereof, you, that you can obtain a, ma a, a patent. Under precedential case law, and specifically by the Supreme Court, there are actually three exceptions to what is patent eligible, and I've listed them here. Laws of nature, so, such as Einstein's um, equation, um, physical phenomena such as electricity, abstract ideas um, such as the ones that are talked about in Bilski, the business method claims such, as, such and things like that. Um, those, those types of things have been considered exceptions. Um, these are not by statute, they are by case law. One of the issues in the cases, in, 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 the, in the briefs that you'll see here, is the concept of a product of nature whether a product of nature is one of these exceptions, whether it falls in with one of these. Um, the plaintiffs in this case, including as well as the district court and even the Department of Justice, has actually assumed that a product of nature is, in fact, somewhere falling within these exceptions. Just talk about briefly about uh, what has happened so far. Um, the case has gone to um, the district court and plaintiffs filed uh, summary judgment motions, and the, the court made a decision at the Southern District of New York. Judge Sweet made a decision on um, to grant plaintiffs summary judgment motion. Um, he issued a decision in March of 2010, a very long and detailed um, opinion. Um, with regard to um, the isolated DNA claims, as I'll talk about in a little bit, there, there are two types of claims at issue, the isolated DNA composition claims and the method, the, the diagnostic method claims. With regard to the composition claims themselves, he made a finding that in light of DNA's unique quality of the physical embodiment information, i.e. its sequence, none of the structure and functional differences between what occurs in, uh, naturally in a cell and isolated DNA render the DNA markedly different. Uh, one of the, the controversial issues in this case is whether that standard is, in fact, the proper standard, whether markedly different is the proper standard. <clears throat> in addition, he said the preservation of this defining characteristic of DNA, i.e., the sequence, in its native and isolated form mandates the conclusion that these composition claims are directed to unpatentable products of nature. So, again, he's using this term products of nature as opposed to um, expressly using the terms that uh, I mentioned before. Not presented on this slide is the issue of the, the method claims. Um, the, the method claims were directed to things like comparing steps or analyzing steps. The district court determined that that was an abstract mental thought, um, that isolating and sequencing DNA was not transformative. It was merely data gathering, and therefore it also did not um, meet um, Section 101. Here's some representative uh, isolated DNA composition claims, which are um, some good claims for us to discuss for the purposes of the, the talk here. Um, the, the claims are directed to isolated DNA coding for BRCA genes or, or BRCA um, polypeptide, either BRCA1 or BRCA2. BRCA stands for breast cancer um, mutations, and, and specifically people who have certain mutations in these genes have a much higher predisposition for, for, for ovarian and breast cancer. Claim 1 is directed to an isolated DNA coding for the BRCA1 polypeptide, where that polypeptide has a certain amino acid sequence, sequence ID number 2. That claim has been interpreted by most people to encompass both um, what's called <clears throat> genomic DNA and cDNA, and I'll get into that a little bit in a moment. 
claim two is isolated um, DNA of claim one where that DNA has a very specific DNA sequence that's set forth in sequence ID number one. That, uh, most people have interpreted that claim to be directed to cDNA because sequence ID number one, as I'll talk about in a minute, doesn't contain any introns. And then finally, there's um, claim number five, which is isolated DNA having at least 15 nucleotides of the DNA of claim one. That's worth taking into account as well because basically um, that can be interpreted as encompassing any isolated DNA having at least 15 nucleotides of, um, of any of the sequence that occurs in the um, genomic DNA. This is a slide that was provided to us by Hans Sawyer. It, um, my understanding it comes from um, Gilead's um, amicus brief that was filed with the district court. And I think it does a nice job of doing some background explanation about what is, um, what is genomic DNA versus cDNA. Um, as most people know, there are, um, you know, pairs of, of 23 chromosomes in the cell. Um, this particular slide is presenting chromosome number 17, and you can see as you, on the left-hand side, as you go down, um, it's, it's getting smaller and smaller pieces of DNA until you get to what's called the isolated BRCA gene, which is 100,000 100, um, base pairs and includes introns and exons. Um, introns are, in fact, untranslated portions of, um, of DNA that exist in the gene when it's, in, when it's actually in the genome. And you'll see there it talks about, um, at the bottom there, it says 20 coding exon segments, which comprise about 20% of the, excuse me, 10% of the gene, which means about 90% of the gene is actually corresponding to regions that don't code um, for anything. And to, to get into that detail a little bit, to look on the right, you see there is um, a little bit of a sample of the genomic DNA. You see introns and exons. That is actually um, um, transcribed into messenger RNA in the cells. And as part of that process, the introns are spliced out. And then messenger RNA is then translated into protein sequences, which you don't see here in the slide. Um, the next step that you see down there, reverse transcription, that is done by um, an, an enzyme that's present in retroviruses, um, reverse transcriptase, which actually makes a mirror image of the messenger RNA into what's called cDNA. And you can see there that cDNA contains no introns, um, and claim two of one of the myriad patents is directed to that sequence. This is just a representative claim for um, one of the method claims from the Myriad um, applications for, for one of the patents. Um, this one's directed to a method for identifying a mutant uh, BRCA2 um, nucleotide sequence, and it comprises a step of comparing one sequence with another sequence. A number of the method claims here, um, either either methods for screening or identifying or diagnosing, they involve a similar type of comparing step, comparing a sequence, a one, one sequence to another. There's also another claim that's a method of detecting an, um, an alteration in the gene that's from analyzing a sequence, so comparing or analyzing. Uh, there is one claim that's a little bit different that's the method for screening, and it comprises a step of growing cells and then determining the rate of growth. This is just a bit of a timeline of what's happened so far on appeal to the Federal Circuit. Um, in short, you can see that uh, briefs have been filed this fall. Most of the, the, briefs have, the briefing stage is pretty much finished up now. Um, we anticipate, uh, assuming there is oral arguments in this case, that it will occur probably sometime in March or April of 2011. Um, just this last bit, I just want to bring this to att your attention for the purposes of some of our discussion. There actually has been a bill that's been proposed by a few congressmen um, in 2007 to actually amend 35 U.S.C. to prohibit patenting of human genetic material. Um, and I have there highlighted in bold what the, the key provision is. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that this is actually incredibly broad, even broader than what was decided in the district court case. It says that no patent may be obtained for a nucleotide sequence or its functions or correlations. So that's any nucleotide sequence. It's not specific to one that occurs in nature, for example. Uh, one saving grace, I, I guess, a little bit is that it was proposed to be prospective in nature, meaning it would only impact patents that it issued um, after the date of the enactment, which, by the way, has not occurred. And uh, with this slide, I just, uh, just to acknowledge that the controversy continues over this issue. And at this point, I will turn it over to Hans. 
Well, thank you, Jackie. The, uh, and I'm just looking at this slide, and I see the patented baby there, and maybe that's a, a good starting point for uh, for an observation <laughs> that I probably hear most about from BIOS member companies about this case. Um, and that relates to the this notion that uh, gene patents uh, confer ownership and control over somebody's genes and the like. Right? Um, I think a lot of bio member companies have contacted me about this case or in conversations with in-house counsel. I, I've often heard the people remark on the plaintiff's arguments that gene patents, quote, uh, stifle scientific research or that they restrict, in this instance, women's access to their own genetic information <laughs> or that these patents interfere with women's medical care or the medical care of patients. Um, I think patent-owning biotech companies and research institutions have probably every reason to be perplexed by such a portrayal uh, because stifling scientific research and interfering with medical care is not ordinarily on the agenda, I can assure you of that. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> the very term gene patent is, is probably a, a very unfortunate term that, that has taken hold in the public debate and that even we use as shorthand, but it is unfortunate because we all know that the genes as they exist in our bodies or in the, the bodies of plants, animals, or microbes, even if they're newly discovered as they exist, are not and never could be Patented, right? Despite despite claims to the contrary, in the press, we you know many of you may have seen the 60-minute segment, may have seen uh, other news coverage of the case. Despite claims to the contrary, uh, corporations don't control your genes, or businesses don't own cancer, um, and women who donate a blood sample to do research on cannot be sued for patent infringement. Uh, despite all such claims, though. Nobody can infringe a patent by having a certain gene or by passing it on to their children. So nobody owns your genes, and that's something that people often from within bio want me to drive home when I talk to somebody about this case. Uh, so, but, but if that's not it, so what is claimed in the thousands of, of DNA patents that have been granted by the PTO over the past two decades? Well, we think that DNA molecules are eligible for patenting for the same reasons that other biomolecules that are extracted or derived from nature are patentable, like taxol from yew trees or cool immunosuppressant compounds from uh, scorpion venom or other sources. Right? DNA molecules can and ought to be patentable, or at least eligible for patenting, if they're patented in the form of artificial preparations that have new qualities that distinguish them from natural genes. Right, the touchstone ought to be, and I think in law it is, that uh, patented DNA preparations have been transformed through human intervention into something that is sufficiently different from the natural gene to qualify as new, useful, and man-made. And this transformation uh, begins with the purification or isolation of the, of the newly discovered DNA. And the resulting DNA preparation then in turn is different from the natural gene, not just in degree, but, quote, in kind. Or in other words, DNA molecules are patent eligible because they have new qualities, advantages, and technical applications that allow them to be used in, in new ways that are not possible with the natural gene. Now that's, in, in, a, in a most general sense, the narrative of why we think DNA, just like other biomolecules, are acceptable material and acceptable subjects for patenting. And if we accept patents on antibiotics from fungi or taxol from yew trees, why do patents on DNA molecules seem to cause so much more unease, as we see in the public debate and in the press coverage about this case? Uh, now, now, we think the reasons can't be the purported interference of DNA patents with patient care. Or, or interference with the scientific comments, staffing research, because empirical studies uh, by, by the National Research Council, or by the National Academies, or the AAAS have found time and again that there really is no clear evidence that such patents, in fact, interfere with basic genomic research. And, and we also know that gene patents are not often enforced. They are rarely the subject of litigation. Uh, and last year, a series of studies commissioned by the SAGAS Committee, the Secretary of Health and Human Services Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health, and Society, these studies found actually very little systemic impact 
of patents on genetic research or on test development or on patient utilization and, and the pricing of such testing services. On the other hand, I often hear from biotech companies that in commercial practice, DNA patents are part and parcel of the portfolios that protect huge investments in biotech product development and commercialization. Uh, and it's often pointed out that this case is about more than just genetic testing. Only a very small segment of BIOS members engage in the kind of business model that Myriad engages in, but we have companies that sequence the cucumber genome or that work on um, the sugarcane genome or that make recombinant biotech drugs. And uh, gene patents are as important for these companies as they are for genetic testing companies. Um, in the case of biotech drugs, for example, we also know that developing a single biotech drug requires an investment of $1.2 billion, and the clinical development period alone takes more than eight years on average. So, so biotech companies often tell us, and I think that's undoubtedly true, that they uniquely depend on their patent portfolios, especially if they're smaller and not self-funded, uh, depend on their patent portfolios to generate this kind of investment. And because DNA patents uh, deal with early stage technology, uh, you know, they are foundational patents. Because that's the case, these patents are more likely to be important to early stage companies that deal with such technology. Um, in this way, we are really quite concerned that a wholesale exclusion of DNA based patents, as is proposed in this case, could uh, more and disparately perhaps impact smaller, earlier stage companies which inherently place greater reliance on basic foundational patents like DNA patents. But it is these small, highly innovative companies that hold roughly two-thirds of the future clinical development pipeline. So, so at the end of the day, we appeared in this case as amicus because we think that a blanket exclusion of gene-based DNA molecules would be quite counterproductive for biotech innovation, at least amongst our members. Rather than a blanket exclusion, patent law has, has better and more surgical tools to ensure that only deserving inventions are granted patent protection. And we also have better tools to protect the public from overreaching by patentees. You know, we don't need to wipe out all DNA-based patents to achieve uh, the goals that we all need to talk about, perhaps. And at the same time, uh, we're, we're quite convinced that allegations of widespread societal harm are simply not supported by the evidence and may, in fact, in many instances, be based on on what may be you know, deliberately perpetuated misconceptions of what these patents cover yeah. and what rights they concern. Um, okay. so that's the reason why we appeared. Um, and, uh, Can we I just cut a little short, Hans, please? Yeah, we're done. Hi, Hans. Sorry about that. Um, just to give a little bit of background of, of how we're organizing the presentation, and I apologize for not doing that earlier, um, what we're doing here is um, each of the panelists are, are being given about five minutes to present their position. Um, Hans is obviously um, just gone, and he has, he's presenting uh, the position of bio. I'm going to go next, and I'm going to present um, the position of the Department of Justice, which obviously isn't um, acting as a panelist here. So um, I apologize if I do not present that correctly, but I'm presenting my understanding of the DOJ position. Josh will be going next. He'll be presenting his position. Uh, he worked on an amicus brief on behalf of American Medical Association and others, arguing patent in um, subject matter ineligibility in contrast to Hans and also Kevin Noonan, who will be going last. Um, Kevin worked on a brief on behalf of IPO um, arguing for patent eligibility. Um, so um, without further to do, I will go forward and give a presentation about um, the, per, the, um, the position of the Department of Justice. Um, the first thing that I want to raise is um, the fact that the Department of Justice filed a brief at all. It's um, very unusual for them to do that um, in, in a situation like this. Uh, especially because um, the Patent and Trademark Office itself is a named party. Now, one thing to, to keep in mind, um, I actually uh, researched this a little bit in preparation for the webinar. In the district court below, the, um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the only, the only papers that they filed 
were actually memos in support of a motion to dismiss the case, basically arguing that there was no standing against the PTO, there was no subject matter jurisdiction, um, there was sovereign immunity, and so on. Um, so the, these, these papers that were filed, they didn't really go on the merits. They didn't discuss the merits of patent eligibility per se. The other thing that's noteworthy is that those papers were actually filed by um, the, the, the U.S. attorney, the, the, the U.S. attorney at the Southern District of New York. There was nobody from the PTO who actually signed those papers. And as noted in those in those memos in support of dismissal, the the case against the Patent and Trademark Office was actually done with regard to constitutional issues. So the constitutional claims was the basis in which they, um, the ACLU and the, and the plaintiffs included the USPTO. And notably, the district court actually dismissed all the constitutional claims against the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So it, it, on one hand, it could explain why the USPTO didn't file a brief here. Um, they may have technically not been required because they, in fact, I guess, quote, unquote, won in the sense that the claims against them were dismissed. That notwithstanding, the Department of Justice did, in fact, decide to file a brief, and um, the PTO did not. And that is, um, that's pretty interesting under the circumstances. Um, the DOJ specifically indicated that it decided to file an amicus brief in this case in response to the district court opinion. Specifically, after reading that opinion, it decided to um, reevaluate whether these types of claims were, in fact, patent eligible in light of um, case law, specifically Supreme Court case law. And based on their interpretation of that case law, it came to some determinations about what is patent eligible and what is not patent eligible. So I was just going to run quickly through what they have determined not to be patent eligible. And in short, um, the, the DOJ determined that genomic DNA, so that's DNA having both introns and exons in the, in the sequence exactly as it exists in the chromosome, that genomic DNA that's merely isolated from the body without further alteration or ma manipulation is not patent eligible. So, for example, we talked about claim one of the 282 patent of Marriott and one of the isolated DNA claims. When that encompassed um, isolated genomic DNA, that would not be patent eligible. The DOJ said that the unique chain of chemical base pairs, i.e., the sequence that induces a cell to express, a, for example, a BRCA protein, is not a human-made invention. And they say that the chemical structure of the genes, of the, the native genes, is a product of nature. So, again, the Department of Justice is using this term product of nature. And it says it is no less a product of nature when the structure is isolated from its natural environment. It did, however, differ from the plaintiff's view in saying what is patent eligible. And it says that man-made compositions of matter whose values derive from the information coding capacity, i.e. the sequence, that those, in fact, may be patent eligible. It says nearly any man-made transformation or manipulation of raw materials of the genome are patent eligible. So this would include cDNA, which they interpret to be man-made, and other engineered DNA molecules, vectors, recombinant plasmids, chimeric proteins, vaccines, genetically modified crops, um, and so on. So, as I mentioned before, what would not be patent eligible? Um, isolated DNA that comprises a nucleotide sequence of exactly what exists in the cell, so the native genomic DNA sequence, that would not be patent eligible. And this corresponds to the claim one that I, I told you about before. Um, and this um, is because, according to the Department of Justice, this encompasses the ordinary BRCA1 gene that would be isolated from a tissue sample taken from a patient in the hospital. What is patent eligible? Um, keep saying that thing. What is patent eligible? This would be claim two of the 282 patent, so that corresponds to cDNA. Um, they also suggested that isolate DNA comprising a, nuclei, uh, a nucleotide sequence that is not what you would see in a native DNA sequence, that that would, in fact, be patent eligible, too. They also suggested a vector that has um, a, a, a nucleotide sequence, even the one that exists um, in the native genomic DNA, as long as it's in a vector, um, such as in uh, reciting claim eight of one of Marriott's patents, that that, in fact, would be patent eligible. 
They also suggest that a microorganism or a comet cell that's transformed with such DNA, uh, whether it be as it occurs in the genomic sequence or at cDNA, that that would be patent eligible as well. The DOJ also suggests that processes or apparatuses for selecting, extracting, or purifying um, DNA and so on, that those would be patentable. Method of treatments would be patentable using DNA molecules. And optimized pharmaceuticals, such as pills and vaccines. Um, vaccines, for example, can um, constitute uh, DNA sequences. <laughs> So at that, this point, I will turn over to um, Josh to present his position on this issue. Um, thank you, Jackie, and thanks to Helen uh, Foley for setting this up and to my colleagues Hans and Kevin, who it's always a pleasure to speak on these issues with. Um, I just want to be very clear, although I'm the messenger for today and had a hand in writing the brief, I'm really the messenger, not uh, the message uh, sender, um, because this is the view of doctors uh, throughout the country as reflected in the AMA and other medical organization briefs. In, in that regard, I wanted to respond to two things Han said, because that may be the position of uh, bio and many in the biological sciences that gene patents are not uh, owning people's uh, DNA or not having adverse effects, but it's clearly not the view of many in the medical community. And in particular, in the AMA brief, we cite to two studies, and I'll read you just the statistics from which those studies show, which demonstrate that there's clearly a difference of opinion as to whether there are harms. It also demonstrates that it's not that you own the you know, genetic material in its natural state. The question is, is if you can't do anything with your own DNA that would be useful, like analyzing and sequencing it without getting patent holder approval, then the consequences of that ownership do preclude you from using your own stuff, analyzing your own body. That's what's being objected to, and that's where the harms uh, seem to come from, including research harms. So the two uh, studies as, uh, demonstrated in the brief say that 49% of the members of the American Society of Human Genetics have had to limit their research due to gene patents, 49%. Now, clearly there's a big difference between 49% and none. Um, somewhere the facts have to be determined, and the district court really didn't resolve the question of which view of the facts is correct. Similarly, a survey of directors of laboratories that perform DNA-based genetics uh, tests indicated over half, 53% of respondents, had not developed a test for fear of infringing patents, and one in four labs had stopped performing genetic tests because of the restrictions or excessive royalty costs. So I just put that out that there's clearly a dramatic difference of opinion as to whether uh, the genetic sequence patents are having adverse effects on research and medical care. Hans said something else which I think is also incredibly helpful, and that's the view of what makes these uh, claims to isolate and purified sequence patentable in bio's view. And what he said is, is that you have to transform something uh, into something sufficiently different. It's an artificial preparation with new qualities, but the criteria for making a difference in kind, something new and different, were that is new, useful, and man-made and allowed to be used in new ways. And we submit that that's a necessary but not a sufficient condition for patent eligibility. And much of what I'm about to say then just elaborates that that's just not enough for patent eligibility. And I've had the luxury of studying as a law professor 300 years of patent history. And therefore, when we go back and look at the relevant Supreme Court precedents, it demonstrates that it's simply not enough. Um, in particular, um, this phenomenon really has a long history where the principal examples of isolated natural products that Hans relies on were granted patents, and then the American Fruit Growers Supreme Court decision came out, and the, what was later became the chief uh, of the patent office said it was a mistake under the Brogdex or American Fruit Growers decision isolate merely isolated things, even though they could be used more effectively or had new uses, simply weren't eligible. Same with Judge uh, Hand's tachamine decision, um, and anyone who wishes to see the citation, again, it's in the AMA brief. 
the DOJ has now acknowledged the same thing in regard to isolated sequences, that although thousands of uh, patents have issued with claims directed solely to isolated or isolated and purified genetic sequences, that PTO has never had the legal authority to do so. The last thing I'll say in that regard is if for some reason the court finds that the PTO did have the legal authority, then as indicated, this goes back to the district court to rule on whether granting such patents would be unconstitutional. The next thing to uh, note is that there's a big difference between the views on cDNA of the Department of Justice and the medical community because um, the Department of Justice basically takes the position if it's man-made again, that that's enough, and therefore that cDNA um, is in fact a different type of thing. Well, the difficulty with that is twofold. The first is, is that because it really does effectively look a lot like the naturally occurring genetic sequences in the chromosome, um, it probably isn't different enough under the relevant precedents to make it a uh, patent eligible thing. If you look at the language from the Cochrane versus Badish Anilin case from 1884, calling saying artificial lizard and making it artificially didn't make it a new composition of matter and patentable by reason of its having been prepared that way. The second is that um, actually the science now shows us, although it might not have been known earlier, that cDNA does occur naturally in the cells. Therefore, there's really no way to distinguish between the isolated sequence claims and isolated cDNA claims because if they occur naturally, as I said, all you've really done, again, is you may have prepared it artificially, but it's identical to what you merely could have isolated. And moreover, depending on your claim interpretation of what the language cDNA means, um, it might apply to merely isolated from cells. Finally, we have the very difficult question of um, what is enough. And uh, there are a number of um, cases, again, the Brogdex case is the most relevant, where you had uh, natural fruit, which was treated with borax. The combination, of course, does not occur in nature. It was human created. It was novel. It was much more useful than the fruit because it had preservation abilities. And the court said, this is not a new and different thing. It's therefore not patent eligible. Funk Brothers, you had a bacterial combination that was the same. And you have to distinguish that from Chakrabarty, where you inserted a plasmid um, to create a synthetic oil-eating uh, bacteria. And there they said it was markedly different, and therefore um, it was a patent-eligible thing. Line drawing is difficult. Line drawing without a theory is even more difficult. So I simply will refer you to a forthcoming article that I am uh, working on, which should be up on SSRN within a month, um, where I talk not only about where the markedly different standard and uh, its analogy to process in the non-analogous uses standard come from, and what different theories we might have for drawing the lines. The most important thing for our present purposes is that virtually all of the claims at issue um, simply do not add novel functions in the kind of way that the court has previously recognized to make something patent eligible, even though they are clearly, in some cases, human-created novel combinations that have uses that you could not do when uh, they occur in the chromosome itself, such as comparison. That leads us finally to the method claims. Um, the methods, as noted earlier by Jackie, deal principally with comparing and analyzing. There's a significant question as to whether there's any structure required for these claims, because if you read the claims, they seem to simply cover the mental step of performing the comparison once you have some information in front of you. How you get the information is not a part of the claim. So um, for that reason alone, these claims are overbroad and also apply to uh, natural phenomenon as well as to mental acts only. But even if you were to read them more broadly, you have to go back to the Bilski case, which talks about insignificant post-solution activity, and the Grams case, which dealt with a diagnostic, which said merely collecting the data so you can perform the mental comparison doesn't make this a patent-eligible subject matter. So I'll stop there, except to reiterate that there are very different views from the doctors compared to uh, many others. 
uh, that these patents cause harm, that these were never patent eligible. The doctors are very grateful that the Department of Justice has finally acknowledged it. And if the Department of Justice recognized adequately that cDNA um, does occur naturally in the cell and is merely isolated from it or is simply an artificial preparation of something identical to something isolated from the cell, it should say that those are not eligible too. All right, Kevin, you ready to go? Kevin? You may need to take yourself off mute, uh, mute uh, Kevin. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, Josh and I disagree about this, obviously. You're not going to get any theory from me. You're going to get basically what I think is the effects of what would happen. But first, let's talk about some of the myths. And, and Josh uh, has mentioned some of this in his view and, and Hans. And, and I think that the, the picture, the baby picture that Hans has was great because it really does get to the emotional part of this and in some ways the most pernicious part of this argument, initially started by Michael Crichton and taken up by the ACLU, uh, that, you know, somebody's going to own you. And, and as we all know as lawyers, nobody owns you because the 13th Amendment says that they don't. So I think that it, although this is something that, that, that gets everybody very excited and is great for magazine articles, I think that we have to immediately recognize that, you know, it's, it's, it's just a straw man and it, it's not something that, that is, is actually, actually happening. More importantly is this information myth that I think was the basis of the district court's decision, which was that somehow being the physical embodiment of genetic information was enough to make DNA unpatentable. Well, you could say that an enzyme is the physical embodiment of chemical information if you wanted to do that, and you could make that analogy pretty much for almost every, anything in this area. Really, Judge Lurie got it right when he said chem, DNA is a chemical compound, and the reason for that is the information isn't what's patented. In fact, the information in all the patents in all the world on genes can be used to interrogate databases on your computer all you want, you haven't infringed a patent. So the idea that you have this physical embodiment part I think is irrelevant in terms of the information. Josh talked about natural products. Well, I think that the isolated DNA is not found in nature, and in fact, cDNA is not found in nature. These line elements that he's talking about that are in, uh, in genomic DNA are things that arose as, as genetic parasites 100 million years ago. And in fact, even if occasionally and very occasionally one of these, since most of them are dormant, uh, actually gets reverse transcribed, it doesn't get reverse transcribed into anything anyone is claiming. It gets reverse transcribed in a very defective way these things are about 6,000 nucleotides long. You get on average about 900 nucleotides reinserted into the chromosome where they cause disease. So you really don't have uh, cDNA in that broad scope because nobody's claiming cDNA in the broad scope. And, and I'm not going to go into the uh, the uh, 300 years of, of case law, but but my reading of it is is that the court really has never said that that uh, there's lots of uh, of, of uh, dicta, but no real no real um, answer there. The inhibiting research myth is the fact that, that I know Josh has the 49% of people think. Uh, people have actually done dozens of studies that Hans has talked about that th there doesn't seem to be any effect. And I understand that, that people think, that the doctors may think this, but I, I want to differentiate between basic research where if you look on the, the GenBank or the PubMed database, there are about 9,000 BRCA1 and BRCA2 papers out there, which is basic research, versus, yes, I believe that the commercial labs are, uh, are not, uh, are not uh, performing these tests because they would be infringing. They're doing commercial activity, and that's different. I think the whole point of the patent system is disclosure, and that's how you promote progress. So let's talk about the consequences of inhibiting that. First of all, I don't think there's going to be any remedy for the women in this case, even if they win, because the myriad patent is going to expire in about five years anyway, and all DNA patents are going to expire by 2020 approximately. Uh, that's really that's really not, not the point. The point really is that whether a test costs $30, $300, or $3,000, uh, an insurance company determines whether or not these uh, these women get the test, not, uh, not, not the patent holders. Um, there's also a consequence, I think, on the biotechnology industry. If you read the Borough report that just came out, there's the, the sector, as he defines it, is going to do much better than uh, the Dow Jones, and I think that perception is reality. If you've had a decision that said the genes weren't patentable, when so many biotech companies at least have them and rely on them, then I think you'd have uh, an economically poor outcome. The other thing I think more importantly is that if you make genes and other things in the biospace patent ineligible, 
that's going to promote non-disclosure. And that non-disclosure is anathema to what academics do. We've had 30 years under Bible with having uh, this, this academic industry, startup industry in the biotech area, a uh, very thickened way that we've gotten an industry. And, and if you inhibit that, then you again converting academia to what it was before by, by Dole, an uncompensated R&D department for foreign domestic corporations, which I think is a bad idea. And so what, what, is, what, what can we expect if we actually get a decision like this? And that is that since the future will be different from the past, we have gotten to, we've done the race to the beginning of the road. We have all this genetic information. We don't know what most of it does. In fact, I could argue that the progress is promoted by patenting because the patent system requires, A, that you know the utility of what you patent, and B, you provide the best mode, neither of which are necessarily required to, to write and get published a scientific paper. And so what's going to be different is figuring out how all these things work out, and it's going to be very, very complicated. And very, very complicated things are easy, are hard to reverse engineer, and easy to protect by trade secret. So I think the problem is going to be, especially as we get more and more of these things that can be very focused and, and can maybe deal with certain patient populations or certain diseases, you can hide the ball. And I've written on ways that you can do that. Um, that's not, I think, in all of our best interests. And, and sort of since I think I'm coming to the end of my five minutes, um, we have to think of one more thing. And that one more thing is the fact that if the DOJ were to prevail in its view that things that were natural products were patent ineligible, this isn't just DNA. Human beings are not that clever. There's a whole bunch of medicinal chemistry out there that is, is based on natural products in the broad sense. And if natural products are not patent eligible, because frankly, Hans mentioned Taxol, you can mention a great many natural products that are not fundamentally, physically, and chemically changed as much when they're extracted as DNA or even better cDNA is when it's produced, if that's the threshold, if that's where we draw our line, then I think the problem's going to be a lot of things, a lot of important things, both traditional drugs and biologic drugs, are going to fall under that rubric of not patentable. And if drugs are not patentable, nobody's going to invest to make them. So this little conclusion slide, I'm not going to go over. You can just look at it. But I, that's where I think we have a fundamental difference because I think that this decision would be bad for not only biotech patenting and, and, and biotechnology industry, but for the rest of us because we, if we don't get these drugs when we need them, it's not going to be pretty. I'm done. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks to everybody who uh, talked about uh, their positions. In this last bit of, um, of this webinar, we thought we would talk a little bit, we would address some questions that uh, are on, on some people's minds. So I'll just raise a few questions and I'll let the, the panelists chime in. Um, the first is, is, is revolving up, uh, around the issue that um, obviously this case has gotten an enormous amount of press. It's something that people who aren't patent lawyers, people who don't necessarily think about biotechnology or work in biotechnology, they, this case is on their minds. Um, this case has uh, actually been discussed in 60 Minutes. Actually, Kevin had a chance to talk about it in 60 Minutes. I mean, it, it's mainstream, which is unusual for a patent case. Um, so why do, you, why do you think people care so much about this case, and what has been the impact of Judge Sweet's decision already, and what could be the potential implications of a decision by the Federal Circuit or the Supreme Court? Anybody got any thoughts? Well, it's how it's been positioned, don't you think? I mean, if, if, if you if – you, I have – in my office, the button from the ACLU that says, do not patent my genes with the silhouette of a woman and a DNA double helix uh, going down her body. I mean, it's the way it's been positioned that, as we talked about, uh, corporate ownership and uh, interfering with, with medical doctors practicing medicine, I think that that's a position, but that's why everybody's excited about it. I think that one of the reasons why I get so much press is because there's a lot of misconception about, you know, that's going to the baby slide. Um, you know, I talked to my family members about this case who approached me about it without me even bringing it up that I was had any involvement in the case. And, you know, they, they said to me things like, well, I don't want anybody patenting things that are my body, and Big Pharma already makes too much money as it is. And so that it's sort of playing on people's fears and people's misconception about the science. I, I think that's part of the reason why it, it gets so much play. Um, Josh, do you have any thoughts about uh, the impact of Judge Sweet's opinion already? Um, I don't know about the impact of the decision, although I do find it quite odd that the Patent Office is continuing to issue these patents, even though the Department of Justice has said they lack the authority. Um, I think in response to the question, there's, uh, again, it goes back to the point, you know, if you tell someone, yeah, it's true, we don't own your genes, but we're not going to let you do anything that you would like to do with them, 
by, you know, which would require isolating them. I don't think they view that as a distinction that makes a difference. So that's where I think some, you know, this is all personal to people because everyone has a genetic sequence. Not everyone owns a, you know, patented uh, electron microscope, and not everyone uses various natural products derived pharmaceuticals. So that's why I think it's so personal. If I can take the opportunity to respond quickly to a few things um, Kevin said, though, and this is, you know, goes back to why is genetic information different? It's different because it's personal, but the actual justification for the exclusions from patentability, um, I don't think that people, when viewing it, think that Judge Sweet's genetic information exceptionalism reasoning holds up. And that's why I tried to explain why the doctors have premised this on a long history of cases, saying that even before when you had natural products and patents were granted, it was unauthorized and a mistake. The second is the most recent case on this issue, the one that said that living, you know, patents on living organisms could uh, occur, distinguished precisely the word products of nature from man-made creations. So the products of nature does have a long history. It's a, you know, framework or a language used to describe the physical phenomenon language, which has been reiterated is excluded from the patent system. Going back to the doctors' uh, surveys, again, I just refer you to the actual surveys where they asked the doctors what they were doing, not what the doctors thought about others. And, and finally, the concern that the sky would be falling if uh, if these things were found unpatentable, I think, is uh, both a little dramatic, but much more importantly, fails to address two basic issues. We used to not think these kinds of things were patent eligible. And we found alternative ways to fund basic research to the extent that it wasn't. Or, as the doctors argued, they don't need the patents to fund the basic research. More importantly, the case law says that the, the newly discovered scientific information has to be treated as if it was already in the prior art. Once you understand that these sequences and their functions and the natural molecules as they occur in nature are treated as if prior art, any of these patents should be viewed as obvious and therefore not patentable validly, regardless of whether they're considered eligible under 101. So again, I think that there's just a dramatic overreaction to the idea that we would exclude these under 101 and the sky would start falling. Well, let me just comment on a few things there. Firstly, I think that, that it is, to my view, foolish, even if the case law says that, Josh, that's foolish to say that we're going to pretend it was in the prior art. But be that as it may, it's a different discussion. The interesting thing is that you can probably practice the method. You can probably determine whether a woman has a BRCA1 mutation and not infringe, almost except for that 15 nucleotide one, which has its own problems, probably not infringe any of the DNA claims. And the reason for that is these historically came from the time when people were trying to make things like erythropoietin and TPA and drugs, basically, that were on interferon. And so you require that the sequence to infringe have the whole sequence. And you can, you can, don't have to even necessarily go after cDNA. You can interrogate using modern methods of amplification, genomic DNA at precise regions and get those sequences and you'll never infringe those claims. So, so even if all these claims went away, I think that there are ways that you can probably get around that as well. So yeah, there are other ways to do it, but you know, I think that, I think that the issue is, is rather than, as, as Hans says, there may be surgical scalpel ways to deal with this, we're taking a hammer at, at this issue and I don't think that's necessary. With that, I'll go on to another question, which is sort of related to this, and it ties into one of the questions I'm seeing that is being presented to us. And it's the issue of whether um, the question should actually be decided by Congress rather than by the courts. Um, for example, somebody raised the issue of whether one way to deal with it would be through your compulsory license or reasonable licensing terms. Um, I also point out that there there are exceptions to infringement that are out there, um, such as the, although it's quite limited, the experimental use defense under Duke v. Madley, um, the safe harbor under 271E1 for um, any activity related to development and submission of information under the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act for FDA approval. Um, there's also Section 287C, which says that it's, non-infringement for medical practitioners to perform a certain medical activity, which people call a pure surgery, surgical procedures or diagnostics. 
of course, that's pretty limited as well um, because it can't involve something that's um, violating a biotech patent or the use of a patented um, composition of matter. So I was just wondering if any of the panelists had thoughts on that. I'll, I'll turn to I'll, I'll, I'll tap on Sean because he hasn't had a chance to say much yet. The I, I think as, as, in, as in other aspects of this case, Diamond versus Chucker Body is probably illustrative. Uh, in this case, not so much because it answers the question of whether isolated and purified DNA should be patent eligible, but uh, it, it, you know, for the broader principles that were applied in that case. You know, that case really was coming up on a question of is living patent, uh, is living subject matter patent eligible? And the court said, you know, there's nothing, you know, in the patent statute that prohibits that. And the fact that Congress couldn't have contemplated this kind of technology when it passed the Patent Act doesn't mean that it's not within the patent statute. The Patent Act, as it re recently reiterated in the Bilski case, too, is broad and inclusive of pretty much all technologies wherever they arise. And if you see specific exclusions based on some category that you make up, I think that's more appropriately a question for Congress than it is a question for the court. And at least in this case here, I think there's a colorable claim to be made that DNA, just like other products that are derived from nature, you know, is not excluded under the Patent Act. Congress, you know, there's no indication that Congress ever intended that to be excluded. And so by default, it ought to be in unless the legislature says otherwise. If it's not for the courts you know, to start carving out whole fields of technology, because, you know, some people say it infringes my right to conduct a clinical diagnostic business or whatever it is. So I think it is appropriately for the more political branches of the government to decide whether DNA in whatever form should be patent eligible or not. And, Josh, what do you think? Do you think that this is something decided by the courts or should be decided by Congress? And do you have any viewpoints that if it is by Congress, what, what should they do? Well, clearly the courts are there to interpret the legislation unless there's a constitutional issue, which there may be here. But Hans, I think, is exactly right. It's just a question of where you place the interpretation of what Congress did in the 52 Act. The 52 Act was supposed to codify the prior law, which made clear that natural products alone even though isolated and purified, weren't eligible. Congress hasn't changed that. Congress could change that, in which case you might get a constitutional question. But until it does, perfectly appropriate for the court to say Congress hasn't actually authorized these. So it's really a question, I think, of whether you like or dislike the court's interpretation and what Chakrabarty, where Chakrabarty reflects that the line was drawn and whether you think Chakrabarty changed the line from the prior precedents. All right, I'll move on to a different question. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about whether anti-eligibility ruling here would violate TRIPS, the, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, um, some relating to international law? Kevin, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I'm not a TRIPS expert, but, but I, I do know that we uh, sort of, you know, WTO imposes um, sort of broad patent eligibility. Uh, I also think that that individual countries have been able to uh, to modify that those requirements to their own local needs. So probably something that we could do if that's how we did it. But I don't think it would violate trips. But it might it might change the uh, it might change the tone we could take with other countries when they um, render things patent eligible or uh, demand compulsory licenses or, or do that sort of thing. Now, there's a provision in TRIPS, it's Article 27.1, that says that each member state is to provide patents or patent rights enjoyable without discrimination as to the field of technology. Do you think that um, what they're doing here with regard to gene patents as opposed to other things are a, a discrimination as to field of technology? Well, it depends on the defined field, but if you think about it, if you take the broadest view, if you take Josh's view, there's there are not fields but acres of technology that are no longer going to be patent eligible. And so I think that I think that uh, um, obviously if, if if the court, if the Supreme Court would decide that that uh, this is how the law has always been, then we have to revisit. But uh, but I think that I think that 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 is a great. 
paragraph in a treaty, but actually applying it individually and locally in each country is, I think, going to have to adapt to whatever. You know, there are plenty of things that uh, there are plenty of technologies that may not be uh, patentable. Um, lots of the prohibitions about patenting methods, diagnostic and, and, and medical methods in other countries that, that have gotten around this problem. So, yeah, uh, yeah. something like that. Yeah. To, to pick up on that real briefly, the, uh, I mean, the permitted exclusions under TRIPS are relatively specifically defined in the treaty itself. Uh, and even though, you know, it's, it's conceivable that some DNA patents, I guess, would properly fall within the exclusions, be it the one for public health or be it the one for uh, living organisms or, or medical methods and the like, you know, the I think a blanket exclusion of all DNA molecules that are gene derived that would probably not fit within TRIPS because how could you justify the exclusion of a gene of a patent on a cucumber gene under the public health exception, for example? Right. So, so, and and so, so that's actually an interesting subject for discussion. I think as broad as it is proposed, it does raise questions. I would, of course, beg to differ simply because the TRIPS agreement is premised, like the U.S. statutes, on the fact that there is an invention which the TRIPS agreement doesn't define, nor does it, by the way, define technology, which is an issue in regard to business methods. Um, the EPO uh, and the EPC, um, you know, it specifically excludes um, you know, things that are similar, including um, business methods, but they add this language as such, which then makes for very complicated questions, both for eligibility and for inventive step as to when you have something that's excluded as such versus when you have something that shouldn't be excluded and should be patentable, even though the essence of the invention, the essence of the creativity, lies in the new scientific discovery. So all I can say is, is that in order to reach the position you are arguing, you have to define invention extremely broadly to cover novel human creations, even though all they are, in essence, are the discovery. Again, I'll refer people to my forthcoming article about why historically that was not the meaning of invention within the patent system. Well, at this point, we have hit the 1 o'clock hour. I think we could probably go on for hours uh, with all the interesting nuances of this case. Uh, but in the meantime, I just want to thank everybody for participating, uh, particularly our attendees. We, uh, we had a nice, large uh, group attending today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Um, this was excellent on this very uh, interesting topic. It will be uh, very uh, exciting and interesting one way or another to see how the federal circuit